everybody, welcome to Narrative Live. We are witnessing what appears to be the biggest cover-up of the largest crime in history. And that may sound like an exaggeration, but it isn't, not really. When you look at what's been happening with the Epstein case, in context of what's been happening with Roger Stone and Michael Flynn and Eric Prince, it's really clear to see what's happening. Bill Barr is basically clearing the decks of any crimes, any investigations, any allegations against Donald Trump. Now, we've seen this in a number of ways recently. Roger Stone. To the US Virgin Isles. Now, the Virgin Isles are part of the United States and Barr is direct line of reporting to the Islands Attorney General. But that's really where it ends. It's not the exact same judicial system. The Islands Attorney General, by the way, has woken up after 18 years of doing nothing about Epstein. And this week she filed a 24 account indictment against the trustees of the state. Now, the case, it's the case itself is strong. It makes sense. These trustees should not be running the state. But what's really behind this case, what's really behind it, is that they're trying to evade justice in the United States. The fact that Barr is given- But as terrible as all those things are, nothing is as bad as what Bill Barr has done with the Jeffrey Epstein case. Because we're talking about human trafficking of young girls, teenagers teenagers trafficked for sex and he's basically killing the case by moving the burden of the case from the southern district of new york to the u.s virgin isles where it will surely die because they're not that interested in prosecuting this or they would have prosecuted it for the 18 years that they were living with jeffrey epstein as one of their residents now the island has an attorney general who has suddenly awoken after 18 years of inaction and suddenly she's filed a 24 count indictment against the estate trustees this week now the case itself makes sense the trustees should not be running this estate and we'll explain why tonight but the fact that the virgin isles has now stepped in and he's suing the estate they stand ahead of all the victims in line if there's ever any restitution from the estates in other words if you're a victim of epstein and you think you deserve some some payment for all the pain you've been through you have to wait behind the island to get your money Again, just to recap our breaking news for you, sources telling ABC News that Jeffrey Epstein died by suicide overnight at the Metropolitan Correctional Center in Manhattan. That, of course, Jeffrey Epstein law. died on August the 10th last year, and almost immediately there were questions. So in the shoe, they should be checked in on every 30 minutes. They should About be. why his guards didn't do their job. The allegedly falsified the records and did not do any rounds for approximately eight hours. How big of a deal is that? That's a huge, huge deal. About whether Epstein was murdered. This noose doesn't match the ligature furrow mark. And about Bill Barr's ties to Epstein, which date back to when he was a CIA analyst in the 1970s, and Epstein was a teacher at Barr's father's school. But now there are new questions about why Epstein signed a new will and testament two days before he died. And about a cover-up. The estate was taken over by Darren Indyke and uh, Mr. Khan, who are two uh, close associates of Jeffrey Epstein. Tell me who they are. On August 8th, in the federal prison in New York City, Darren Indyke and Khan, his assistant, had Jeffrey Epstein sign his last will and testament and trust documents two days before Jeffrey Epstein's death, two days before Jeffrey Epstein was reported to have taken his life. So his mental capacity two days before would be in question as to was he functioning cognitively, was he within the realm of being able to make an intelligent choice in signing these documents because he killed himself two days later i have nine years experience with jeffrey epstein one to one nine years that's the longest amount of time i believe of anybody that actually knew jeffrey epstein continuously on the business knowing side business and social side so I understood Jeffrey Epstein and I understood Darren Indyke, who's now the man that had Jeffrey Epstein sign this giant will, last will and testament, 
over to him. Over to him. Days after Jeffrey Epstein tried to kill himself, and two days before he did kill himself. So he was running around America doing a lot of these things with complete impunity. There was no one who was going to arrest Jeffrey Epstein for anything he did. Correct. He actually said that to one of the lawyers for the rape victims, Brad Edwards. He tried to convince Brad Edwards that he was protected by the government. And here's Darren Indyke, who was involved, you say, from 19... 1993 onward to to right this second. That's a, you know, so he's got decades of, of knowledge about what Jeffrey Epstein was doing. And he would be viewed in any normal system, you'd think he'd be viewed as a co-conspirator in all these events. He a, he's named as a co-conspirator in Washington. How is it possible that this man is now in charge of that estate, which these victims so desperately need to get a hold of, as some sort of restitution for what's happened to them? Well, the Virgin Islands Attorney General challenged Darren Indyke in court two weeks ago, saying that he cannot run the estate because he's a part of the criminal misconduct and he has a conflict of interest. He's been served and charged with misconduct in the Virgin Islands courthouse. Now, isn't it amazing that, yeah. it, that they can do it, but the United States won't do the same thing? Well, well the United States is in a very difficult spot and they're concerned about the greater good of what can be done for the benefit of national security against a case like this I mean I don't know how you sort of forgiving you went to jail for 18 years for the, this kind of cover-up uh, we're looking at another cover-up of the death of, of Jeffrey Epstein here. We're looking at a cover-up of the rapes of these young young women or these girls. How is it? You know, I, I mean, I get that you're you're you know you've you've tr you've transcended yourself in some ways and and found a way to to find a, a path forward. But you know, there's a lot of people who have a lot of anger towards Jeffrey Epstein and to the government and to Bill Barr for doing so little. Well, there is an issue of justice for all. Is there different levels of justice? Justice for the level of Jeffrey Epstein, the super rich spy, and justice for the level of the American working person. So there's the question that's not going to go away. It's not going to go away. And particularly because now we're learning that there, I, I, I just did a cursory look through everything I could find. I found five key areas where there's a direct conflict of interest. Um, between Mr. Indyke, Mr. Khan, and all the things that they did with Mr. Epstein. I'm going to run you through some of them. I did a look at all the holdings that Jeffrey Epstein had uh, in the U.S. Virgin Isles, and there were about seven significant ones. Uh, there were the Financial Trust, uh, the Gulfstream Company, which is basically how he operated his private planes through. There was a company called VT&T, which was a company that helped bring uh, communications to the island. There's a company called Southern Trust, which is probably the most significant. I'd say, you know, if there was a jewel in this crown, if, the, if there was, indeed was a crown, Southern Trust would be the one because it is where most of the liquid cash holdings right now are in, as you point out, about $250 million. And then he also had a, uh, an education foundation, the Enhanced Education Foundation, and something called Southern Country, which I'll get to in a second, which is a, uh, a private bank, because who doesn't need a private bank? And then another foundation called COUQ, which he worked with the Clintons with. So you have seven different entities there where Richard Kahn and Darren Indyke are not only the uh, managers of the estate, but they were also directly involved in setting these things up. And in each of these cases, there's some sort of criminality going on. Um, this just seems too much of a conflict of interest here. It's not even conflict of interest. This just basically looks criminal to me. There's no question. It's totally criminal. My reaction is it's impossible in any legitimate playing field for Darren and Nike to be in charge of all of this money and all of the future of the victims. And he is in charge of it. And it's impossible. It can't be. Take the, the Gulfstream Company. The Gulfstream companies basically ran the Lolita Express. This is a nickname for Jeffrey Epstein's 
uh, jet was. It carried a lot of rich, rich and famous people, but it also carried a lot of underage girls to and from his island. You know, these guys, Khan and Indyke, ran that company. They established that company yes. for him. They yes. are party to trafficking teenagers, underage women. They've been charged with that in the Virgin Islands. In the Virgin Islands, but not in the United States they haven't. And it's unbelievable to me that these guys were involved in human trafficking on this scale. Nothing happens. Um, and certainly, they st and then there's this conflict. Second thing here, we've got um, the Southern Trust Company which is this big uh, company with is $233 million in, in, in assets right now, plus an additional $176 million in, in its uh, financial, uh, Southern Financial, which is a company allied to that. This company has listed as its manager, as I mentioned earlier on, Cecile de Jong, the wife of the former governor, John de Jong, who himself was in, involved in a whole bunch of corruption, and she's still listed as the main person there. So the main person who's holding the biggest check that the victims can get a hold of is the former governor of uh, of, of the of the island's wife, and she's hired by Indyke and, and Khan. Now, I don't know very much about how the U.S. Virgin Islands work, but it doesn't seem to me like the kind of place where you can guarantee fair justice, uh, because it's a small island. There's a lot of corruption that goes on. Certainly, her husband was was party to that corruption, and here we've got all this money that should be going to the victims, and it's never going to get there because. Who knows who these people are who are actually handling the money on a day-to-day -day basis? Oh, that they converted a tremendous amount of securities and investment money into $248 million at very deep discounts. There were tremendous losses in the investments and the securities, and somebody got a big amount of money in the losses taken by the estate. It's shocking that they, this was done without any approval, as far as I know, from the from any courts. And it's you know it's a significant change in the assets of the estate. And I'm told it's legal for them to do that, but it's still unusual um, for them to be liquidating such a huge amount of money for purposes that we can't tell. Especially because when you look at his other company, this uh, this uh, this bank that he had. I mean, who needs a private bank? Uh, I guess if you're Jeffrey Epstein, you have a private bank. It was called Southern Country, registered in the Virgin Islands. Um, didn't really operate like a bank. I guess he just used it as his own secret bank. Uh, and the interesting thing about Southern Country is that, according to the New York Times, it's missing about $12.9 million. But let's say they're unaccounted dollars. Because after Epstein's death, in, in December, in mid-December, $15.5 million was deposited from Southern Trust into this private secret bank called Southern Country. And then 2.6 million was returned to, to Southern Trust, leaving a remainder of $12.9 million. But guess what? By the end of the year, when they did their final statement, they did their final accounting, that $12.9 million that should have been there, unaccounted for, no one knows where it went. That's correct. They said, they said in court that they did not know and that it might be errors in the paperwork that they filed in court is what the answer was this week. I find these kind of, you know, we just don't, I don't, I don't I'm not a banker, I'm not an accountant. I don't know, it seems like $12 million, $13 million missing from anywhere you'd notice. But um, who knows why they decided to use this, this, this bank that no one had been using. It was basically a dormant company. And suddenly, after his death, for no good reason, out of the blue... That's Darren Indyke. That's the illegal operations of the estate hurting the victims, transparently hurting the victims. This case has got to be transferred to New York City. This case must be transferred. It has to be transferred. The case smells. It smells. It does. There's another situation here with the Epstein Foundation. He called it the Enhanced Education Foundation. It was designed, actually, to help the island with its uh, its education, uh, and especially advanced education. But in reality, the, uh, the that foundation was often used for other things. Like in 2017, it paid off 160000 of Epstein's personal fines. And then at other times, he ba he backed local politicians. Maybe it was the governor's, uh, the governor there that he's, his wife was working for him. He backed their political campaigns using this money from this foundation. Now, who knows why he did that? But guess who was along for the ride? Indyke and Khan were along for the ride throughout that whole thing. It looks like a corruption scheme. And that same 
corruption scheme involves the same island um, administrators that are busy trying to get this money for their uh, or from the state. Um, and you know, it looks like there might be some undue influence between Indai Khan and uh, and the Virgin Islands uh, officials there, because some of this money, which was under their their under their control, um, as as partners of Jeffrey Epstein, landed up funding some of these politicians. What I would charge first is Indai and Khan, and let the Virgin Islands officials stay on the side to explain their activities later on. The first thing that has to be done is remove Indyke and Khan and get a legitimate firm, a big firm, a legitimate firm, a major accounting firm, Price Waterhouse or somebody like that, to take this over to do a correct estate administration. Because right now you have a, a continuation of a criminal enterprise, another scandal that's worse than the first scandal. I think you're right. I mean, it's, and it's and it's and it's also victimizing the victims again, the same victims that I have to go through. You know, even more difficult court cases, even more. You have two scandals. You have pre-death and post-death, and the post-death scandals taking place in your interview. Mm. In, real in real time. In real time. In real time, and you should stay on this topic of the second scandal. Of course, the first scandal everybody knows about. The second scandal is taking place in real time this minute. You're you're correct, and I gotta say, I'm worried that it's going to suffer the same kind of cover up that the other crimes, the early ones had. I don't I think so. I think the media will pay attention to this, and the victims will definitely pay attention to this if they're not paid damages. But I don't think they're going to get paid the damages. I believe there's not going to be enough money to pay what they want in damages. So there's $258 million. The Virgin Islands wants $80 million or $86 million, and they're going to want $50 million in fines. So they want $130 million. So all that you have left between the cost of the lawyers and the running of the estate, you have total left of a hundred million and you have to sell the trophy properties. So you don't have much money left. There's no reason for me to imagine why the Virgin Islands deserves any of this money. And let me explain to you why, because Denise George, who seems like a lovely person and who's been on TV as the Attorney General uh, of the Virgin Islands, claiming that she had nothing she had no knowledge of what happened in the previous administration. She doesn't know what happened. State, why pursue these sort of charges now? Well, all I'll have to say is why not now? Um, I, I, I cannot speak for what happened in the past at all. And what Denise George is saying is that she has no idea of what happened in that previous uh, administration. She says she was not even a part of that previous administration. In reality, she was in fact very much a part of that administration. I did some research on her, and it's right there on her on her bio. If anyone wants to look at it, in between 1998 and 2016, she worked in the Department of Justice there as the Assistant Attorney General, and she prosecuted embezzlement, forgery, fraud, racketeering, public corruption, and get this: she co-authored the Virgin Islands' first criminal child abuse law. I think Jeffrey Epstein is probably accused of all of those crimes. So it's stunning to me that she wasn't able to prosecute him when all those crimes were taking place on her, in her territory throughout the time she was an assistant AG. But before you get to her, you still got to deal with the co-conspirators directly of Jeffrey Epstein, Baron Indyk and Khan. I agree. But I don't see how anybody can look at this case and say, you know, we're going to let this important case, this top important case that really matters to the American public. And because it's, it, you know, it strikes at the heart of who we are and our own independence. It's and, scandalous. It's and scandalous. we're going to let Denise George, who is maybe involved in some weird ways by not prosecuting this case early on, we're going to let her take that's charge of this? That's what's happening right now. That's not this okay. Minute, this minute, that's what's occurring. The second scandal is worse than the first scandal. This is all going to be exposed. And now there's a second scandal. 
I looked at all of Jeffrey Epstein's uh, investments and donations and things that he did on the Virgin Islands. It's extensive what he did. I mean, he, he was a big donor of a lot of philanthropy. He owns the island. I think the Virgin Islands are party to the crime in some ways. And for them to be now deciding to inject themselves after not doing anything all those years when that was happening right there and there in, on their, in their country, on their, in the, on their islands, how is it possible that they could not do anything then? And now they've decided to grow a conscience. Now it they've decided to do something. It's a horrible scandal that's going to damage the victims terribly, terribly. And it's going to get worse. The scandal is going to get much, much worse. Well, if all the victims, and there are victims, you know, we describe them as the, as the rape victims as well, but there's the victims who were suffered because of your, uh, of the things that happened to Towers Financial, but there's lots of other victims, I'm sure, that we haven't even t known yet, of because course, there's course. so many crimes they we haven't, haven't done. Yet. Yeah, so there's probably, you know, far more victims than any, uh, even if you had this the full amount. This is going to be the biggest problem in the United States Department of Justice, for years to come. It's the biggest case in American history, as far as I can tell. I mean, there's never been a case that has spanned four decades, involves national security, but also involves, uh, you know, everything from human trafficking to, you know, potentially drug trafficking, potentially all these other things that we've been learning about what's going on in those years. It's so much. Uh, this is a monstrous, monstrous case. There's not been anything bigger than this. You're doing a good job. Zeb, you're doing a good job but telling the story to the public. The public has to understand what you're trying to explain. And this is a very complicated case. So you have to explain it carefully. Carefully. And I'm willing to help you ongoing to explain it carefully. Because I've been involved in this case in enormous litigation within it and research and being part of it for nine years. And You're one of the few people I know that has uh, has that kind of first-hand knowledge of, of what Jeffrey Epstein was doing. And, you know, people could tell you things a million, a million ways, but when someone has first-hand knowledge, when someone knows who they're talking about, and they know the character, and they know the person that they're referring to, their, uh, their evidence... I know all the people. I know the majority of the people in the case personally. And I can, I can testify to what's taking place. It's unbelievable this is going on. I got to say, I look at, I, you know, there's a lot of concern about what's happening to the Justice Department here in, in the United States. There's certainly been, a, you know, a, a continuous cutting back of what we believe as fair justice. A lot of cases that we thought would get uh, into the court system are not getting into the court system. A lot of cases that may in the future should have got, may, would have gone. Um, in the past would have gone to the court system. In the future, they won't be able to because of Bill Barr's new laws yes. and regulations. But I think, I think America is going to have uh, demand of accountability on this case. If people start hearing about it. Arena. It's very hard but to get people to pay attention, i got to say. Um, and because, as you know, people don't like to report on stories where it involves an, an Israeli agent because... No one wants to hurt the state of Israel. I but certainly don't. But you don't have to talk about that. You can talk about Darren Indyke stealing the money with Jeffrey Epstein. But one of the reasons the Department of Justice has not been able to do, probably the main reason why it's not been able to do what it needs to do justice-wise, is because it keeps hitting itself up against this intelligence aspect. Yeah, but Darren Indyke is separated from the spying. He's not named in the spying. Agreed. So we can deal with the money component of damages for the victim. We can try to get justice for the victim. I That's think justice for, justice for the victims in this case is not going to involve someone be saying, I'm, you know, this person is guilty or not guilty, I believe. This justice is going to come through all of this money, all $650 million, as much of it as possible, needs to go to the victims. That's about the only yeah, restitution. The guy will never allow that. Well, it's, he's, he, got he's, a, he's got a piece of that. $150 but there, then he's part of a criminal enterprise and he needs to go to jail um, and, and he doesn't want to do that presumably um, I mean that's where and maybe he thinks he'll be protected by the same things that Jeffrey Epstein was protected by we're going to see the scandal, scandal 2 is open now 
Stephen, thank you very much for your time. I really appreciate you joining us today on Narrative Live. We'll hopefully have you back again. Uh, there's a lot here, and, uh, and I'm sure the audience is going to love hearing from you in the future. I certainly loved hearing from you today. And uh, thanks for joining us on Narrative Live. Good day.